Okay, so today I'm going to give you an extremely brief overview of our survey findings. Our report is available upstairs on desk in the foyer if you would like to check it out. And it's also available on our website. So, as, as Vicky already mentioned, our sample size was 3,600 permanent residents, which is actually quite large for a survey. Um, and the reason we had such a large sample size is because we wanted to have 200 people in each district to make sure we had broad geographical coverage. Uh, so our method was to stop people on the street with iPads and ask them questions, which enabled us to show them visual aids in some of the questions. And it also enabled us to get uh, basically a cross-section of the entire public and not just those who actually can be found in open spaces at any given time to ensure that our, our sample was representative of the population. We had quotas by age and gender for each district. And one special feature of this research is that we actually asked every respondent to identify the housing estate or street where they lived. Therefore, we can pinpoint them on maps and that will enable us to do some uh, geospatial analysis later on, which my colleague will talk to you about later. So, in this survey, we actually asked about eight different types of urban open space because, you know, the typologies are quite diverse. People use different types of open spaces in different ways, and we want to know about this. Um, I'm not going to read out every single one, but I want to highlight um, what we mean by unofficial open spaces here. Um, I'm not sure if this works. Basically, these are open spaces which, as Raymond earlier stated, are not specifically designed or managed for the purpose of recreation, but which people use anyway. Examples being the Saiwan Cargo Pier down in Kennedy Town, or for example, Garden Hill in Sham Shui Po, which is popular with photographers. Um, I'd also like to highlight here the private housing estate open spaces, which are not a form of public open space, they're only accessible to residents. But since this type of open space is available to such a large proportion of Hong Kong people and probably quite heavily used by them, we actually included it as well. So these are the results for how frequently people visit these eight types of open space, um, with the most frequent category being once a month or more. and least frequent being never in the past 12 months. So the most frequently visited types of open space in Hong Kong are actually our small playgrounds and sitting out areas because these are the most common types. They are available pretty much everywhere near where people live. The second most frequently visited are possibly those in public housing estates. Um, about half the population lives in some kind of subsidized housing in Hong Kong, so it's not surprising. And actually, the third most frequently type, uh, visited type of open space are the podium gardens and plazas in shopping malls. The private sector actually provides um, public open spaces in private developments, but even though they only make up 2% of all of the open space in Hong Kong, they are actually very heavily used by the public. Therefore, the private develop the private sector has a large influence over the open spaces that people encounter and use in their daily lives. So we asked about how satisfied people are with the open spaces in their communities in these seven different dimensions, quantity, management and maintenance, crowdedness, personal safety, trees, plants, landscaping, beauty, and the available activities and facilities. So overall, um, on a scale of zero to 10, most people gave around a six, a seven for personal safety. This is the average score. Um, the whisker bars that you see here, they represent the standard deviations. So 68% of all the respondents fall within these whisker bars. So there's not a great variation. Um, not that many people gave zero, not that many people gave 10. Um, so you could say that most people are, you know, okay to mildly satisfied with the open spaces that they have in their daily lives. But let's break this down by district. So we did some statistical tests to figure out which districts were more 
satisfied than the others at a statistically significant level or less satisfied at a statistically significant level. So the pink squares are basically your average ones. They're not very different from the usual. Uh, the green ones are better than average and the dark purple ones are worse than average. So you can see that some districts perform better than others. Um, Southern District and Sha Tin are the most highly performing ones. Um, we're not exactly sure why this is, but my guess is that Sha Tin benefits substantially from its cycling network and from its riverfronts. And Southern District, well, most of our respondents there were in Aberdeen because that's the largest population center. And I think a lot of these people uh, enjoyed waterfront promenades there. Uh, the worst performing districts are tend to be the older urban districts, which is not that much of a surprise. Um, Wan Chai, Yang Simwang, and Central and Western to a lesser extent. And we can actually see what I think is happening in the next slide here, which is that people living in private individual buildings, sort of individual freestanding buildings, are less satisfied with pretty much every element of open space. So this is the blue bars you can see in the middle of every single one of these columns. It actually it dips down. And I think basically these are people who don't have access to immediate open space downstairs from where they live. They don't live in you know large estates. And so they live in much more densely packed environments with probably less open space per capita. And so it's not very surprising that these districts do not perform as well. So a recommendation here um, is to upgrade the quality of small open spaces in old urban districts to encourage more usage. And that these, we feel that these uh, open spaces can be better integrated into the surrounding urban environments rather than surrounded by, by walls and fences. Um, we actually, I'm not going to show you the figures here, but we actually find that in these districts, people go to open spaces less frequently, probably as a result of the poor perceived quality. So a major theme in our research was planning inclusive open spaces um, for you know, multi-generational use over different life stages. And we find that different age groups actually use different open spaces more. So the gray bars you can see are the 60 plus age group and you'll see that they are most heavily using the small playgrounds and sitting out areas as well as those in public housing estates. And as uh, Raymond earlier stated, um, elderly people are not willing to work, I mean walk very far to open spaces. So these are the most readily available types to the vast majority of the public. But you see that um, the 16 to 29 age group has a quite a different pattern of open space usage. They are mostly going to sports facilities and in fact usage of sports facilities it basically frequency per month drops more than in half after the age of 30. And you can see that uh, the young people are also going to shopping malls a lot more with their friends most likely meeting up with their friends in shopping malls and probably hanging around outside. But beyond satisfaction, well, what do people actually want? Um, we gave people a multiple choice question. We gave them these eight options and we said, out of these eight, please pick three. What do you want in your community? And so the most common answers here were, well, obviously more shade, which is not surprising in our climate. Uh, shared cycling and jogging paths. We were a little surprised by this. People want to jog, they want to cycle. So more places to sit and chat. Um, I guess people want seating where they can, can gather with friends, have a conversation, not just sit by themselves. And more lawns. That was the fourth most common choice, 45% there. Now let's break down these preferences by age group. So you see that there are certain things in common, like pretty much most of the age groups pick shade in some capacity in the first, second, and third choices. Um, bicycle paths, chosen by everyone up to the age of 59. Seating also quite broadly chosen. But you can see that lawns here are a greater priority among the younger set. 
and I think this reflects changes in attitudes in Hong Kong towards what you do with grass. When I was a little kid, probably not that long ago, sorry, <laughs> most of the lawns had a sign saying, keep off the grass. And people just accepted that. But it's changing slowly, and people are getting used to it, and they're like, they, when they get used to it, they like it. So younger people, probably um, those in their 30s and 40s with families, they like having lawns. For the oldest age group, you basically don't see any active facilities here. They're, they're not really interested in riding bikes or jogging. So our recommendations. Expand shared jogging and cycling paths to more open spaces. There's currently a pilot going on in uh, the Kuntong waterfront in East Kowloon, and we'd like to see that expanded to more locations. Um, provide more accessible lawns, mm, self-explanatory, and to provide more shade and seating arrangements where people can interact with each other. But when you have different groups, age groups, and different um, prior, you know, desires, there might be potential conflicts. So this question, we asked people, which of the following nine activities do you think are feasible for the government to allow in most open spaces in Hong Kong? So let me just flip these. You can see it's not a high percentage choosing any particular activity. The highest one is walking dogs at around a quarter of respondents. But overall, 48% of them chose at least one activity. So basically, about half the population wants some rules to be relaxed, but they don't agree on which ones. But you can see that, again, different age groups have very different opinions about whether activities should be allowed or not. So you can see that um, the youngest age group is much more likely to want activities to be allowed than the oldest age group, and it's a very steep fall off for some of these, for, especially for cycling and for dog walking. So how can we satisfy these conflicting needs given a limited amount of space? We basically need to think more creatively. So. Our recommendations, um, we can select experimental sites to try out different rules and regulations. You don't have to have the same rules in every open space. You can, um, especially since we have such a lot of small ones dotted around the territories, you can pick some to allow some activities and some to allow other ones. Um, we are recommending activity zoning in larger open spaces, so you don't necessarily have to have um, an open space or a facility that's designed specifically for a single activity, but maybe to group compatible activities into different zones. And maybe we can try time-based rules, because different people go to d open spaces at different times of day, different um, days of the week, um, for different purposes. So we could follow these natural rhythms and perhaps allow different activities at different times. For example, um, allow children to ride bikes or play ball games on the weekends, or to allow um, people to walk dogs at night when they're less likely to encounter small children. Um, we also think that um, open spaces should be more targeted to the particular demographics in their areas. Um, we know, for example, that the elderly are mostly using the small sitting out areas and the open spaces in public housing estates, so there's no reason why those spaces shouldn't cater more towards their needs, and other spaces could cater towards you know, other demographics. Um, for our overall recommendations in this report, uh, we think that the current guidelines should recognize the diverse types of open spaces. Right now, the guidelines only group them into local, district, and regional, but within these size categories, or these catchment categories, there is actually a lot of diversity within them. Uh, a, an urban plaza is quite different in characteristics to a residential playground, even if they might be very similar in size. We feel that the design guidelines um, should be created for inclusive open space planning, not just at the level of individual open spaces, but at cross neighborhoods and districts. So even if it's not possible to cater for all age groups and all demographics in a single open space, then across a district, somebody should, everyone should be able to find something. And we also would like uh, the government to further engage communities in the planning and design 
of open spaces at a very local level, which would enable them to be targeted towards the specific needs and preferences of the people living there. Um, so before I close, I'd like to point out that um, I've basically only presented the left side of this um, structure here. These are our basic findings, but at the same time, our geospatial information has been analyzed by my colleague, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Chow, in conjunction with Lands Department map data, and he will share his findings with you in the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karine. Thank you. All right, Marcus in the middle. Marcus, please. Karine, thank you uh, very much for a very interesting and high quality presentation. I speak as a dog lover and on behalf of other dog lovers. And I think uh, we have become a city of dog lovers. Uh, in many respects, dogs have taken the place of babies in, in Hong Kong, as can be seen by the number of prams that are wheeled around with dogs in them. <laughs> I speak from personal experience as well because I live near Cyberport Park, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, incidentally a very badly managed park. but. Uh, in any case, it has many of the qualities that you mentioned just now. Uh, it is a large lawn. Uh, it has lots of trees for shade. Um, and it is, uh, half of it is open to dog owners, and the other half is not open to, to dogs. Now, interestingly enough, the half that it's open to dogs is, is extremely lively and much better used than the one that is closed to dogs even though the area that's close to dogs has a better quality lawn. Um, and there are a lot of uh, young families there, elderly people, uh, and uh, young kids running around. It doesn't seem to be a problem. So I, I don't really understand why um, many of the larger parks in Hong Kong uh, seem to restrict uh, people from walking their dogs there. It's very difficult to find uh, a proper open space to allow dogs to run freely in Hong Kong. Um, okay, well, I, I agree with your remarks, um, and I know that um, we actually ran some focus groups and we asked people this question, do you want to allow dogs in open spaces? And well, I mean, the answers were pretty divided. Some people, you know, were like, we like dogs, we don't mind them, and then others were like, we're, we're deathly afraid of them. No, absolutely not. Um, so, I mean, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult to handle, and, but I think that more diversity should be provided, more choices should be provided, and that um, there's a few dog parks in Hong Kong, but I don't think there's nearly enough. Uh, we could actually drill down into the data and see which districts tend to be more dog-friendly than others. There actually are variations, so we could use this data to target, you know, spaces better. Thank you, Karine.